Well, uh, today we're going to talk about kind of an emotional and a, a difficult subject. I don't think I've ever talked about this subject, ever. And, and that might tell you something about my fear of this subject, okay, or, or my own lack of development in this subject. It's rejection. And rejection is so common in all of our lives. I mean, it's not just for adults, but but kids... As, as you guys start going into adolescence, you're going to understand a lot about being rejected because I remember what it was like to be 10, 11, 12 years old and trying to fit in with everybody and trying to be cool. And, you know, if somebody said my shoes look bad, it was like it's just a terrible day. You know, it's just ruined. You, you know, I rejected my shoes or your, your shirt looks stupid. And it's like, man, you remember what that was like to be young and trying to, you know, you want the coach to like you and you wanted all your, these cool kids to like you. And rejection is just something that just a part of life. We all know uh, a lot about it. And, and yet it's not just something that's psychological. It's not just something that's for counselors as, as we deal with that a lot. But it's also has a lot to do with really at this base and on, on how we see ourselves in God, our, our picture of God and whether we feel that God accepts us or not, as we are. Now today I want to read a passage of Scripture that may not immediately leap out at us as being about rejection, but just, just hang with me as we go through this, and I think that we'll get some insight from it. Matthew 21, 28 to 32. Jesus says, But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him, and you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterwards as to believe him. Now, I don't know if you ever heard that scripture before. It's, it's, it's not preached a lot. It's, you know, it's a rather shocking thing to say. Here he is speaking to the religious leaders. These are the guys, guys, literally, men who have made it their profession to know about God and to answer questions about God, and they are the leaders uh, of their day, and they are giving their lives to him and telling others what to do. And he says to them that the tax collectors, and the tax collectors, if we're just starting out here, tax collectors in their day were Jews who had sold out to Rome. They were traitors. They, they were patriotic traitors. And they were also kind of like mobsters because they used extortion to get more money from people than what they were supposed to get. And he says the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Now, now we know who that is. He says they're going to get into the kingdom of heaven before you do, you religious people. That, that's shocking then. That's still shocking. I mean, to think that the people that are really trying to do good and, and help other people, those people are going to be behind the traitors and the prostitutes? That's how shocking this is. But Jesus rejected these religious leaders' actions and their teaching about him and the Father. Now, we, we've all been rejected so many times. I, I mean, it, it's just it's just... A common human experience. We, we always hear stories about if you want to be a writer, if you want to be an actor, or if you want to be a movie maker, you know, anybody like that, you better get used to being rejected because you're going to be rejected over and over and over. And the only people that make it in that industry are people that can handle rejection and keep submitting that manuscript, keep submitting that movie or, or whatever. It's a little bit different now. Now you can get on YouTube or do a blog post and it can go viral and you can kind of come in the back door but it used to be only that you had to go through editors. And, and, and so we all know those stories uh, about how people have been rejected. Walt Disney, um, here's just a few famous ones. Walt Disney uh, was let go from the Kansas City Star 
uh, because he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. It's a bad fire, wasn't it? Walt Disney. Uh, Oprah Winfrey, she used to be a um, evening news anchor at a station in Baltimore. She was fired because she got too emotional. <laughs> Little did they know that <laughs> Oprah's, Oprah's emotions would, would make her billions of dollars. Jerry Seinfeld, a uh, comedian, was once uh, learned that he was cut from a little minor role in a sitcom as he read the script for that night. That's how he was rejected. Elvis Presley, early in his career, performed in Nashville and was told by a manager that he needed to go back to driving a truck because he wasn't going to make it in music, see? Now, here's, here's a letter from Walt Disney stating that they do not hire women. It says the letter, the letter is written in 1938 to a Mary who lived in Arkansas who applied to be a cartoonist. And the rejection letter just happens to be from another woman named Mary who says that women don't draw at Disney. Only men draw cartoons. Women could trace the cartoons and color them in with ink, but no women can draw at Disney. They just get to write rejection letters to other women, see, <laughs> apparently. Now, of course, this is kind of a class rejection. And uh, most of us have been rejected at some time because we were the wrong gender, uh, we were the wrong age, we were the wrong color, uh, we were the wrong religion or whatever. People get rejected all the time because of just class. It's nothing that we've done. It's just kind of who we are. So you might may identify with that. Here's uh, another letter from uh, the Department of English at LSU. That kind of stopped me to begin with, the uh, English Department at LSU. But here, here what it says. It says, thank you for submitting. Unfortunately, the work you sent us is quite terrible. Please forgive the form rejection, but it would take too much of my time to tell you exactly how terrible it is. So again, sorry for this form letter. That's the form letter, is to tell everybody how terrible they are. That wasn't even personal. Everybody gets rejected, don't we? So many times, I mean, these are just kind of the famous ones. I understand that Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, probably one of the most famous short speeches ever given in American history, was not received by everyone well. Um, Here's the New York world accused Lincoln of gross ignorance or willful misstatement with his declaration of four score and seven years ago. The Democratic-leaning Chicago Times said, the cheek of American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat, dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. See, you don't have to be a loser to be rejected. Winners get rejected too. You know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily who we are or what we do. And I, I remember that, that Jesus said in Luke 6, 26, he says, watch out when everyone speaks well of you. Well, that never has happened to me. I, has it happened to you that everyone has spoken well of you? There's always somebody that doesn't like us for something. Sometimes they just look at us and don't even like us. A third letter I want to show you is funny. It gives us some ideas. I always, always tell you it's funny so you can laugh when you want to, all right? So, so it gives you some ideas about dealing with rejection. It is, uh, the letter was written to Herbert Milliton, chair of the search committee at Whitson University. I've never heard of that, but it's in Massachusetts. Dear Professor Millington, thank you for your letter of March 16th. After fair, careful consideration, I reject, excuse me, I regret to inform you that I am unable to accept your refusal to offer me an assistant professor position in your department. This year, I have been particularly fortunate in receiving an unusually large number of rejection letters. With such a varied and promising field of candidates, it's impossible for me to accept all refusals. Despite Whitson's outstanding qualification and previous experience in rejecting applicants, I find that your rejection does not meet my needs at this time. Therefore, I will assume the position of assistant professor in your department this August. I look forward to seeing you then. Best of luck in rejecting future applicants. Sincerely, Chris Jensen. It's imaginative, isn't it? Great. 
So how do you deal with rejection? I mean, this is one way to deal with rejection. You just say, I'm going to move on. I'm going to reject rejection. Uh, I don't have any room for you now, Mr. Rejection. Um, you, I, I've got to move on. Sorry. Uh, that sounds so right. That sounds so easy. And I went to some pop psychology sites online and and uh, looked at you know this subject, and that seems to be one of the avenues that they suggest that people should take, is they should just say no to rejection. You're rejecting me, but I, I'm sorry, there's no room here for that today in my life, and so I don't hear you, I'm not being rejected. And if that's the way you handle it, I don't want to reject the way that you reject, okay? Uh, but let me just say that for me, that that has not worked too well. Just that's, that's just for me, all right? I, I've, I've tried that. I'm terrible at just pretending that I'm not being rejected, that it just doesn't matter. You see, like most guys, um, I've tried doing this. Uh, you know, I, I don't like talking about being rejected. You like talking about being rejected? I, I don't like, I don't want to go through it. I don't need the drama. I don't want to talk about this. I mean, I don't want to analyze it. I, I don't want to do anything about it um, other than just pretend that it didn't happen. I mean, yeah, I, I could do that. I just go on. I mean, it was a bad day. It was, they were a bad person. It was a bad week. It was a bad month, bad year, what, whatever. I don't want to do anything about it. I just want to go on. And, and the, my experience in doing that is that that's not really that successful with dealing with rejection. I mean, just deny the rejection. It, for me, it just, just hasn't worked. It's taken me a while to come to that. Um, it's just not very successful. Most of you know I was an adopted child. Um, I'm not going to tell you my life story, just a little bit out of it that has to do with this. Adopted child adopted by wonderful parents into a... American dream kind of home, um, had a collie, pony, collie dog, a Shetland pony, had a go-kart on a farm. My parents, I never had any real trauma in my life. The biggest trauma, you know, came just in adolescence and just growing up. That was just normal, but uh, never really had any traumatic rejection at all. I had a wonderful, God, God just blessed me with a wonderful family to adopt me. At age 40, I began having dreams about my uh, biological parents. And it's just strange. I never, never thought about my biological parents. My sister was always interested in them, but I never went down that road. Who cared? I got wonderful parents that adopted me and what difference does it make? But I started to have these dreams. And at the time, I was, I was in a, a doctoral program, and the, one of the professors there became a very good friend of mine. And we were having dinner one night, and he was, we had been talking about dreams in, in one of the classes. And I just kind of shared that I'd been having these dreams about my uh, biological parents. And he was kind of poking in me just a little bit, just gently, you know. And he, he says, well, why don't you tell me something about your adoptive father. Well, my adoptive father is just a wonderful, wonderful man. Just, just a great, kind, gentle, hardworking man. Everybody loved my father until he killed himself when I was 21 years old. And, and when he killed himself at age 21, I just dealt with it, you know, just I'm not going to receive that. Um, I thought I had everything fine. For 20 years I went until that night when I was sitting with this, this professor eating dinner and he started poking around on me and, and I realized that my adoptive father, the father that I'd known all my life, had really, really hurt me. He killed somebody that I loved. He left me. He rejected me. And I never went to his grave, 20 years, never paid a visit to his grave. And, and it, it started to come to me that, my gosh, I've been rejected all this time. All this anger that I've got in me goes probably back to that day 
you know. I've still got some anger. Um, but I started to identify that it goes back to being rejected. My point is, is that I know about pretending. I know about pretending that it didn't hurt, pretending that I've moved on, pretending that I can't do anything about it. I mean, the wound is still there. It, it just down deep, you know. A couple of weeks ago, we are working on the house, and, and I got a splinter in my finger. It's still got a little wound right there, and, you know, it went in there straight like that, and we were working, and um, I looked around for a knife, didn't have a little knife, didn't have a needle, so I got home that night and took the needle and dug around on that thing and got it out, you know, and, and it, it's no big deal, just a little bitty splinter. But I knew that had I left that splinter in my finger, it would have eventually come out. It might have taken a month or two for it to get infected enough. Oh, this is going to be gross. And <laughs> fester and, and push, you know, my body would have pushed that little splinter out of me. With, you know, it would have gotten red and big and I would have gone around, probably bandaged up my whole hand and held my hand up like that, right? You know, ah, I got a splinter. But it would eventually come out of me. But just pretending that it isn't there uh, won't do any good. Now, not everybody denies what has happened. Um, some of us learn to make rejection our lifestyle, our identity. Um, we get used to being rejected, and we know how that feels, and that kind of becomes who we are, is I'm rejected. My, my life's terrible. Uh, people have done some really, really bad things to me, and let me tell you about what they've done to me. And we kind of take that on. And I immediately think back to, to one of my heroes in life, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. You all remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, you Winnie the Pooh people, okay? Uh, Eeyore was the continual pessimist. That no matter what happened in life, you know, something worse was about to happen. And his whole identity was what was bad that could happen. Uh, if, if he wasn't losing at something, uh, he wasn't happy at all. He made rejection his identity. And I think we got a picture up there of Eeyore. And um, of course, Eeyore had a pin on tail. And there's one episode where he has this real trauma that he loses his tail. This, the pin on tail comes off. And it's, you know, it's, it's just terrible. And Kanga, the, the kangaroo, makes him this really beautiful tail and pins it on him. And you think that Eeyore would go, oh, what a good day. No, this is what Eeyore's comment is. He says, it's an awful nice tale, Conga, much nicer than the rest of me. <laughs> Typical Eeyore, right? Something good has happened to me, but it must be a bad thing because I'm a bad donkey, you know? Now, not everything is bad about rejection. And I bring this up not just to spin it for you, but so that we might be able to re respond to rejection in a way that's healthy and, and fruitful. Some rejection for us is good. Um, it really is. We, we, we very seldom will see it as being good at the time, but rejection can be an end to something that's bad for you that you don't really know is bad or you're not willing to face that's bad. Did you catch the story, I think it was a week ago, that it hit the news about uh, the young lady down in Tennessee whose fiance canceled the wedding and then she did this photo shoot where they squirted paint on the wedding dress? Did anybody see that on the news? I mean, it was like just super weird. Her name is Shelby Swink, age 23. She was prepared to marry her boyfriend of three years. Then on November 1st, the unexpected happened. Five days before the wedding was going to take place, she'd planned this for months. Really, she'd planned it her whole life, if we know women, right? Okay, and, and for that day, and then this guy backs out five days before she's going to be married. Now, can you imagine a greater rejection than this? I can't. I cannot imagine a greater shock. Then five days, you've got everything bought, all, you know, all the parties are happening and everything. And he says, sorry, I don't want to do it. Wow. 
terrible rejection. And she said that at the time that she was just in such shock, that she was numb. She just, you know, you can imagine what's going on in her life. And so some of the bridesmaids and a photographer suggest, well, why don't we have a photo shoot where we trash the wedding dress? Because she's not going to use it again. She's not like going to go out and find another husband and go, hey, I've already got a ring, got a dress. You're interested, <laughs> you know. So, so what's she going to do with this wedding dress? So at first she's a little reluctant. So here's the result. This is what they do. They just get the squirt bottles of paint, and they, they all get paint all over themselves. And she said, the moment that the paint hit my dress, I was free. All the disappointment, all the hurt, I just felt it lift me. She says, I can't even describe how liberating and cathartic the experience was. Now, really, she's celebrating a good rejection. She really is. She didn't lose a husband. She was never, never married to the bum, was she? No. What if she had gotten married to the guy? What if she had married him and she'd found out later that he's the kind of guy that cancels the wedding five days before the wedding ceremony? What if, what if she'd gotten married to him and spent years with him of all that struggle? So this was a really a good rejection. And sometimes we're faced with the pain of others that, that is beyond our control. We have nothing to do with this, and we come to grips with the reality that when that happens, that it's good, even though it hurts a lot. It's good. And then there's the rejection that happens because we've, well, we've been selfish, we've been lazy, or because we've not done what we've said that we would do, or we've lied, or we've not faced reality. I mean, that's really these religious leaders here, they're being rejected. Their way is being rejected by Jesus. And we're let go from the job because we've been a bum at the job. We just haven't done what we should have done. That's good. We're being faced with the reality of what I've done with my life and who I've become and the truth of who we are and what we do. And that's good even if it's embarrassing or it's painful. What, what if everybody got an A? What everybody in life is just going to get A's. You go to school, no matter what you turn in, you're going to get an A. You're doing D work, but you're going to get A's. Would you like to live in that world? Boy, I don't want to live in that world. Where, where my incompetence is, is rewarded by somebody and said, oh, no, that's really good work, Don. Uh, it's really a D paper, but we're going to give you an A because everybody gets an A. What about if, if you're, you know, everybody that's on the team gets best player of the team. Everybody gets the trophies. You want to live in that world? I don't want to live in that world. We're, we're, you know, being bad at something or not even trying at something is rewarded by someone else. What an insult that is to us. How, how tracking how that, that is for us to say, oh, we don't want you to ever try to be any better or do any better or learn anything or grow because we're going to reward your incompetence. And sometimes we are rejected, and we should be rejected. It's a good rejection. We lose something, and something happens to us, and we wake up and we go, wow, I guess you know I need to study a little bit harder because D's just not going to work for me. It's not that the teacher is rejecting me. The teacher is rejecting my work, and the teacher should reject my work. And then there's the good side of rejection when we are rejected because we're following Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples that was going to happen. He said, families are going to be divided. You're going to be persecuted. He says, it's going to be bad. You think they persecuted me? Wait till they persecute you. You're not above the teacher, he said. The pupil is not. And there's going to be times in this world, there should be times in this world, where we are rejected because we follow Jesus Christ. See, if we are never rejected at all, if everybody's applauding us, we're probably not following. We're probably really not following him. Part of being a Christian is being rejected. Paul said it like this to 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 11. He says, that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Romans 12, 14. 
He just expected persecution. He said, bless those who persecute you. There's your response to them. You don't hate them, you bless them. He says, bless and do not curse. And that is what Jesus meant when he said, pick up your cross and follow me. See, some people aren't going to like who you are in Christ. They're not going to like you because you reflect who Jesus Christ is. And friends, if that isn't happening to us, then we're not reflecting Jesus Christ in this world. My question in that situation must then be, are they rejecting me because I resemble Christ? Or are they just rejecting me because I messed up? Okay, If it's Christ that they're rejecting, then it's stay the course. If it's me because I messed up, okay, then God is trying to wake me up and say, you need to listen to me, you need to grow, you need to develop. God's trying to get my attention. Now, let's come to the end here. I want to give you some good news, and that is that God has not rejected us. God does not have a measuring device for you. He does not look at you and say, you're good enough for me, you're not good enough for me. God never rejects us. We reject him over and over by saying, no, I don't want it, but God never rejects us. The gospel is, is that Jesus Christ was rejected for us. That's what the gospel is. He has been measured and he has been found to be perfect. And he says, if you accept who he is, then his perfectness gets laid on top of you. And that's who I see. Christ has been wounded for us. God doesn't wound us. Christ has been wounded for us. He was rejected for us. And when it comes to rejection and the pain that we sometimes experience in this world, no matter all the, the, the counseling and, and the psychology things that we can do, some of us very, very good, I firmly believe that the wound is going to be there, the splinter is going to be there until we accept who Jesus is and we hide our lives in him and we walk in him. For only God the Father can really be our Father. Did you hear me? Only God the Father. No matter how good or how bad your earthly father is, only God the Father can really be our true Father. And God has not rejected us. But in so many ways we have rejected Him. We began with that passage from Matthew where Jesus said that the tax collectors and the prostitutes would enter the kingdom of God before the religious leaders. And Jesus was not rejecting the religious leaders. They had rejected God. And he was pointing that out to them. That if, had they known the Father, as he said, that they would know him. And they had not known the Father. In his book, What is Good, Philip Yancey told a story about... Uh, being invited to speak at a conference on ministry to women in prostitution, that's a, that's a rare invitation, a conference for women in prostitution. And they invite him to come speak. And after some discussion with his wife, Yancey agreed to accept the invitation if he could have the opportunity to speak personally to some of the women and hear their stories. So at the end of the conference, Yancey had the following conversation with some women. This is what he writes. He said, I had time for one more question. He said, did you know that Jesus referred to your profession? Let me read what, you, what he said. I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Yancey says to them, he was speaking to the religious authorities of his day. What do you think Jesus meant? Why did he single out prostitutes? Well, after several minutes of silence, a young woman from Eastern Europe spoke up in her broken English. She says, everyone has someone to look down on, not us. We are at the low. Our families, they feel the shame for us. No mother nowhere looks at her little girl and says, honey, when you grow up, I want you to be a good prostitute. Most places we are breaking the law. Believe me, we know how people feel about us. People call us names, whore, slut, hooker, harlot. We feel it too. We are at the bottom. 
And sometimes when you are at the low, you cry for help. So when Jesus comes, we respond. Maybe Jesus meant that. Isn't that a neat response? They enter into the kingdom of God before so many who argue about theology or doctrine or how to worship God, and they decide who is in and who is out. The rejected of this world get it because they identify with Jesus. They grasp that Jesus was rejected for them, and he took their test. Now, God does not reject anyone. We reject him. We reject his love for us. Rejection by a parent is probably the most damaging and painful rejection that there is. Only God is our true parent, no matter how wonderful, no matter how terrible. Your earthly parents, only God is sufficient. No matter how we are rejected, God, your father, never rejects you. Take that home with you. You bury that deep in your heart. God never rejects. Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out